Peter Welchering. Peter Welchering. Journalist. Teacher. For now, living in southern Germany. He says himself he is soon landing in his pension and now he's talking about the constriction of the journalistic world. Yeah, maybe both are connected because if I see how my job develops, I'm happy to be 62 and not just 32 and some developments I can just accept more easily. So what's being constricted? What are the guardrails that have been changed? And how can journalism escape the, the bubble? So journalists can finally do their job properly again. So obviously we need the help of the audience, readers, watchers, all of them, because journalism can only escape the bubble if you help. If you say properly what are your expectations to the journalistic products, if you help uh, uh, discuss these channel, uh, using these channels with the journalists. So, next slide. I assume that media, especially the press and public uh, broadcast, also private broadcast, can only do their job as a gatekeeper and also enablers of participation, enablers of building a public opinion, if they can work unhindered. And that is the job that we do. And there have been several discussions in the past. Some of them have been running for many years. I will just focus on newer ones. I won't go as far back as the oldest discussions. But the discussion affects us strongly right now. And I brought a study that is one month old now from the Technical University of Dortmund the Institute for Journalism and Steinbrecher who leads this institute he found that the believability of journalism lost in the pandemic well journalists were never really held in high opinion but his um, results are shocking indeed. So 41% of all Germans say the credibility worsened. So they lost credibility. 43% say journalism worsened in the last years. More than a third say journalists are dependent on the powerful in politic and economy. And, well, 28% say that journalism lost the contact to the people. And that is bad because we want to include and enable many people, especially uh, minorities, and make their opinions heard. And 62% mean that journalism is exaggerating too much and scandalizing. During the pandemic, there were other studies as well that checked how did journalism develop. Very interesting was this done by Dennis Graef and Martin Hennig. It was published two years ago in 2020 in March and they checked 51 um, uh, 51 programs or shows of the first public uh, broadcaster in Germany, 42 of the second one, 
and they found four tendencies. They said there's a lot of crisis rhetoric, very emotional, and they tended to agree with state management. They found that medicine uh, doctors uh, doctors and virologists were turned into heroes and what the politicians decided, which was sometimes just ideologically founded and was not really a uh, fact-based, not always, was consolidated. So parts of this study were retracted because apparently the pressure was very high and that impressed me a lot. There was a strong discussion, so it's not that journalists slept during the pandemic and didn't critique anyone. So journalists, we discussed a lot what we were doing. And some two years ago, there was an essay from Daria Gordeva, who mentioned that this war rhetoric during the pandemic and also notioned that this is a danger for democracy because the journalism didn't really fulfill their guardians and gatekeeper function because they were just helping politics. And Klaus Ulrich, who isn't working anymore as well, he said journalism it turned disastrous. And we have another study or an uh, essay by Klaus Meyer and a colleague, and they analyzed Corona um, information that was published. And they said that the data in this pandemic just wasn't good. The data wasn't good. And they also indicated that many anecdotal stories were told and structural problems in the health management and that became much more obvious uh, during the pandemic that worsened. They weren't um, told enough those problems. There was missing transparency. So what were the sources of the journalists? How did they reach their conclusions? The reports were very close to the political um, agenda. And all the interconnectedness is not unproblematic. So in the summer of 2020, um, it, it was titled The Time of Neutrality is Over. Journalists have to take sides again. And yeah, we had a, lo a strong discussion and I'm not keeping it a secret that I am a strong proponent of the neutral neutrality um, principle that journalists should stay neutral and be as objective as possible. I say as possible because truly being objective is impossible. But I have to quote my sources. I, uh, I have to be objective with the sources and I can't just um, select my sources due to convenience. And I have to put my own opinions aside and to just examine what the facts are and sometimes what I can find, even if it's not empirical fact. Then there was this study by Markus Maurer and others, Maurer and Reinemann 
They work at a university in Mainz, at another one in Munich. And when the study was shown to the public in Berlin, they had very differing approaches, which is not a bad thing. So if we check the data of this study, I have a few graphs. Then, for example, one examination about the fulfillment of Corona measures. It showed, well, this is the gray area here, that the measures were acceptable and most showed that. So this is a meta study. It compares different examinations, I think. Uh, and yeah, so the measures increased and as the numbers fell, the cases fell, the measures were taken back. And a few of the studies found that the measures were going too far. And the colleague Markus Maurer, I can't show a video, but I'll um, mention the main points. He said that this great gray area could be interpreted such that they are just reporting close to the government some other man, uh, numbers. They examined journalistic publications and so there was they were examining is it the consensus of science or in politics or is it more ambivalence or dissent and the yellow is mostly agreement especially when the pandemic was bad and then they were mostly reporting the consensus and saying yeah there is a consensus and that's where we are right now and when the science was presented, then they wanted to see how is it shown. They were saying, also there's uh, statistical uncertainties always in the knowledge. And does it focus on these or is it shown as, yeah, that's pretty much fact. And in red, here we see, those are the articles where they talked about the uncertainties, also statistical uncertainties. And in yellow, there's the essays or publications who read as if there were no uncertainties. And that was quite an interesting result. So we can see that many journalists probably didn't do their job properly. But rather they followed the mainstream and that's understandable. Many people were insecure and wanted security. But it's problematic nonetheless. Interesting is as well, at the beginning of the pandemic, Drosten was very prominent in the articles. In fall of the first pandemic year, Karl Lauterbach was quoted far more. So Drosten is a virologist. And in the second year, Karl Lauterbach stayed more important, who is a German politician. So Drosten, who had a podcast in the MDR that stopped now, the state rather low. And Henrik Streeck, we can see it quite nicely here. He had a development with a PR firm, another vir virologist. So he worked with a PR firm with Kai Dickmann who also said this first study was a mistake properly. But yeah, that also afflicted the reporting. So doctors and medical institutions, as scientific actors, they are quite strong and were quoted a lot. 
and other scientists, they were cited far less. It's increasing now, for example, the question what happens with the kids, with the children. But within the two years, they were not represented quite well. So the two main authors um, evaluate this differently. So Alexandra Borchardt also wrote an essay here, or a column, that made me suspicious, because she says that this study found that the study is talking well of journalism during pandemic, but if you look at the raw data, I say this could be discussed at least. It's not that simple. But this interpretation was, uh, um, many people came to this conclusion. So let's see as during the Corona pandemic, even more close, uh, more, more obviously than before. And we can see that at the Ukraine war right now as well, but already 2014 and 2015, many of these issues were shown with a lot of um, sources. So there's this book that also explains it quite nicely from a communication science perspective. But let's stay in the now, in the younger history. So what are the dangers? We have no critical um, publishing. And instead we have people who just say what the government wants. And many of them are maybe not that bad, but they want to remain in the mainstream. And it's not not weird. There was a lot of social sciences in this because journalists recruit from the middle middle layer of society, maybe height, uh, a bit higher than that, but it's an area. So, the middle class, basically. And so they are recruiting people who belong to the mainstream and want to belong to the mainstream. And it was... And also the middle class is very closely aligned with the state and obeying the state and also they want to be rewarded for that by climbing the ladder, the social ladder, as it were. And of course, also small issues and small mistakes in the pandemic, they were totally as exaggerated but not put into context, but other points were they took forever until they were properly worked through, like the masks affairs, it took forever to be properly worked on but we reported quite quickly on how in the beginning certain vaccinations were not as viable um, confirmed, uh, confirmed by first studies. So, during the pandemic, we lost a lot of credibility in general. First, it looked like people would believe journalists more, but then there was the study of the Institute for, Journalist, uh, for Journalism. As it shows, 
the bigger interest of the people for information because they wanted orientation and information. It was confused for credibility. So all in all, in several areas, we lost credibility, not just in pandemic critic, uh, critics of the pandemic, but also very much in the area, and that can be proven empirically, in the area of the civic middle class, because they wanted information and, and guidance, but fact-based guidance, and that's not what they got. And it was also often questioned, what are the values that journalism uses and follows? And yeah, objectivity, democracy, that was often confused with um, ethos or patriotism, so a pa party politics, basically. So, yeah, and the gatekeeper function wasn't really kept up in the last two years. We thought that, yeah, we have to overcome this crisis first before, before we can handle these wrong developments. And yeah, but people also didn't want taking care of journalism, but they wanted to be informed using facts, but yeah, also many fled into talk shows and that was criticized and that journalists didn't reflect according to their um, professional ethos anymore. And it was found that many journalists during the crisis were only, only wanted to see their own focus, their very small focus that wasn't asked for anymore. And that also devalued the job, the profession. And not only in the crisis, but it uh, made it more obvious that overdone storytelling to capture the attention of the readers just didn't work properly. And there was the cause of Reluzia that happened in 2018 and was discussed then or was discussed then in 2018 and made us look at journalism more critically. And again, before the pandemic, there was this trend, but it continued during the pandemic, that journalists were presenting themselves more and more and not the story, not the data, not the study that they wanted to present. And that was critiqued as well. Then there was a heavy discussion. How do we want to report on COVID? And well, if the media, uh, if the media is one-sided or unilateral, well, of course, data is one-sided. But that was a discussion because we have. We are fact-based, we want to be fact-based, and uh, we have inside theory. But yeah, all the problems are multidimensional. And as soon as we are connected to the constitution of world and journalistic worlds, that's multidimensional. Because we are limited beings, we have our limits. We have a limited horizon and we can only take one step after another. And if uh, one-sidedness is proposed, then people usually have a weird definition of truth because journalism and as in science, we should always try to falsify because really certain information, we don't have a lot of those. 
And most of our knowledge that in, with all our limits we do have is limited as well. So that's why it's very important that we have journalistic principles that we keep up and that we do not confuse them with a party line that we have to keep. So we have to be followers of the truth, first of all. And there seems to be a sound issue. In the meantime, I... Oh, yeah. Sounds back. Then, based on that facts that we find, we have to be open to change our thesis. So, there was this idea in a, a report that we did on farming, and the thesis was that someone wants to build a monopoly. And yeah, it turned out that SAP, IB, uh, IBM and others wanted to do that up to Monsanto, but that didn't work in Germany because we have a lot of small unions. So we had to change our hypothesis. And so we had a different one in the end than in the beginning. But many people are critiquing that now. If a research leads to a different result, because they say, well, we were expecting this, how, do you, how come you change the story? And you maybe know the nice thing, the nice saying, I won't let facts destroy my nice story. But yeah, our hypo you must be ready to change your hypothesis if the facts just don't support it. But it also means to reflect in my socialization, in my professional constitu uh, constitution, how does that change what I produce as a journalist. So I have to be critical of myself. I have to question myself. It also means to protect minorities and minority opinions. Of course, we entered the false balancing discussion quite quickly, and that is important, but false balancing is must not be used as a censorship. To see a minority as a minority, that's totally fine. But to suppress them, that is what's not supposed to happen, uh, must not happen. So, yeah, we have to check, check and check again with all the methods we have. And right now with all the pictures that reach us from Ukraine, that's especially source checking. But of course, having a second source and other methods, we need to do that. We need to be open. We need to uh, unprejudiced, unbiased. And of course, we have to always try to be ideal, uh, objective. Uh, that's an ideal that we can never fully reach. And we must also be conscious of that. And we need to listen to the other side as well, not just a second source, but also the yeah the the, the op opposite side. And in the Weimar Republic, there was this policeman who survived the National Socialistic time and later worked for Adenauer, even. And he is called Dofifat, and I have a few quotes of him. So it's 1963. Uh, uh, so patriotism and attitude so in the 1920s, Dofifat said he was a man of the center. And he furthered that attitude. But then he switched to the National Socialist. 
and he dropped that in 1945 and in 49 he became one of the uh, one of the advisors of Adenauer. In, yeah, in an essay in 63, he always said the journalist has to show their conviction in his journalism or in their journalism. And then in 2020, there was this new journalistic center who said, yeah, we um, teach in the tradition of Emil Dovivat. And they also named their rooms, and one was called Hanna after Hanna Arendt, and one was called after Dovivat, and that obviously led to discussions because the journalism of him to honor that with a room and put it next to Hannah Arendt is daring up to weird, and after a longer discussion it led to make this room without a name but this problem with the conviction journalism those in power there in this journalism center didn't remove that here i have a reasoning of frank überall who is working uh, he's part of a committee there and they say, no, we are not referencing him, we are referencing the structure. But yeah, that's a problem. When we talk about conviction journalism, it's always um, a paid journalism, a, a mandated journalism. And what we have also, uh, mostly learned from the British people about journalism since 1945 is that we have to distinguish ourselves from mandated journalism. And yeah, so and, and I think the main difference is that attitude and position our stances are self-critical at times, but conviction is does not. Conviction just means that you assume that you are right and just try to execute upon that conviction. And if you confuse the two, that means that you want to have a goal that you want to achieve. Instead of just report objectively, you have to uh, try to achieve a goal who confuses attitude and conviction, who wants to decide on information. And sometimes they want to deny reality. That happened a lot when, we, when uh, conflicts in Eastern Europe was ignored, that's now coming back with a vengeance. And who want, it does that wants to argue or judge on a moral and ideologue basis. And very often it is com confused to comment on facts. But and sometimes they just um, um, don't take the facts into account anymore at all. And now, so, uh, about a week ago, Patricia Schlesinger from Berlin Brandenburg um, public broadcast, she talked in an interview with the paper Zeit. Uh, well, in this interview, she said that conviction has no place in journalism. It was a very interesting interview and two journalists from Zeit had this with two higher level German politicians and conviction and also posture and attitude was very important 
and these two ways of seeing things were contrasted quite clearly. And this discussion was very important for ARD, the first German public broadcast, that it's very important in um, public uh, public broadcast in Germany to really differentiate here. And there was this essay in 2020 as well that I wrote and I put my main points together in this essay. There are many quotes and there is more of a historical di discussion as well about the background and the distinction between conviction and attitude. And now the last slide. Let's give it a bit time to do its work. The issue that we have is that coming from a conviction journalism, it turns into a daycare journalism or or rather a welfare or care journalism. So we have to nudge people and teach them. And this ex um, replaces the gatekeeper function. So in digital journalism, we are confronted with a selfie journalism, where not the structures... So for example, they are not talking about the structures behind COMEX, but how I as a journalist researched these structures. So that is then the main point. So this selfie journalism is more entertaining, of course, because the structures are dry. But that also leads to uh, leads to the journal digital journalism that was lauded as very participative because people can participate and have their opinion heard as well. So that's replaced. And ideology becomes more and more important. So affirmative journalism that's very focused on um, pushing the mainstream and the political the governmental opinion and yeah pushing that and originally people should be educated and being enabled to form their own opinion but that's that's more and more replaced and it's put nicely in the sentence well don't confuse our uh, our listeners with new knowledge and there's still all sides present in public broadcast but we have to be careful that this constriction doesn't proceed and that we find our way out again that there are these constrictions in crisis times that's understandable but we have to reflect them critically what happened in these past two years and what do we have to do to work on these deficits that happened that are understandable that can be that might have um, good reasons but we want to come back to a journalism that has the task of promoting knowledge and facts and we need listeners and so all in all the audience be it, listen, be it listeners or readers to push the professional makers of journalism so they can together exchange about the worldview and say what did we plan our product as and how did we plan the journalism and uh, we have to exchange our opinions so now i have to join the big blue button no yeah okay no i'll stay here for the moment thank you very much for this input we have a few questions that we have to hurry through so we don't dis uh, destroy the timing, the timetable. Would you still, 
how can journalism still be the fourth force in the state and control if nobody can pay for it? Well, yeah, we need something that is being paid for, and that's public broadcast, and that is well paid for. There is a lot of money collected, I think 8 billion, and then more from ads, another billion. But we have to question certain things, be it, spo be it sports, be it uh, entertainment. But we need to do proper research, quality journalism. But yeah, in this context, everyone ac accepts that it costs millions to see a sporting event in TV. And I would think, I would deduce that nobody fights back, or very few people focus on it, but everyone thinks, well, what's my piece of the cake? Yes, and that's fatal. We can't focus on what do we get out of it, but we have to see we have to plan a new digital strategy in the public area, um, realm. I don't know anyone with a proper digital strategy. And I really hate that so much money is spent that is uh, for productions that are then only shown on big providers. But there is no platform no public platform. And I also sometimes ask, do we really need public uh, the sport and the public broadcast? Or could we just save that? Do we really need talk shows that are quite expensive and are privately produced, usually by the moderators, instead of productions done by the broadcasters themselves, as it was used to be 20 years ago. So what about the quota pressure? Well, journalism should not care about that. If I only want to get a good quota of viewers, then that makes it difficult for me. I need to provide participation for minorities. And that has to be more focused, that has to get more focus. We need to, we need to uh, obligate ourselves to do that more and more again, because it's important. We lost it a bit. The question in the end. So, not to bow to the rate or quota, to uh, the, yeah, the market share, basically, that means you have to stand up and stand up for yourself and everyone has to move in the same direction. And if we see each journalist as one muscle, then it's not coordinated. No, it must not coordinate it. We need different characters in journalism. We need different approaches. And we also need dif dif yeah, different approaches in journalism. But what we need is um, we need journalistic um, attitude and stances, posture. And it also means that differing opinions are not just ignored, as we see more and more, but that they are given space. And we've seen that as well. Some minority positions that could be scandalized, they were abused just for market share. And that's uh, sim uh, just as wrong as saying, yeah, I want market share by doing mainstream, because it's easy. It's just as wrong. Okay, thank you very much again. Big round of applause for this talk. And yeah, thanks to all of those behind the scenes, the signal angels, the cameraman, the translation angels and everyone. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I want to take something up. That what those people did, that's a, an alternative media scene that has to be more developed and that gives another chance to journalism. Yeah. Nice fight.